Hi, everyone. Welcome to my session. Thanks for coming uh, to Managing Your Emotions on the Roller Coaster of Debugging. Um, so my name is Omar. Um, I currently work as a graphics engineer uh, on the map at Snapchat. Um, I'm based in Ithaca, New York, and I grew up in Egypt. Um, I've been in the US for about uh, seven years now. Came here uh, for undergrad, for college. Uh, and I have a background in making games, used to make games back uh, back in the Flash game days. Um, and you can find more about me uh, on my website here. So what I want to do today is uh, tell you a story um, about um, debugging a particular problem. And um, I want to do this because I think it happens a lot of times when you see someone solve a problem, uh, and it looks easy. And it looks easy because a lot of times, um, a big problem can be solved with just like a one line um, fix or just like a couple lines. Um, and so it doesn't look like a lot of work uh, went into that. But then when you try to do something like that and you're stuck on it for maybe hours or, or even sometimes days, um, and it feels like you're not making any progress, um, and it feels like, you know, at least for me, like I feel like I'm dumb and like I'm uh, not smart enough to, to find this like very simple fix. Um, but I want to say that um, this. This is a very common thing that happens. A lot of these uh, very simple looking fixes often come from a um, very complicated process that, that it took a, many, a lot of hours or, or many days um, to fix. So I want to kind of expose that. I want to show like what, what, what goes behind uh, something that looks very simple and what was the process to kind of get there. Uh, and in doing so, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like uh, general uh, debug good debugging practices and generally like techniques for solving like hard problems and, and like what to do when you get stuck. Um, and, and one of those uh, techniques, as I, as I call it here on the slide, uh, building emotional resilience. Um, because um, surprisingly, this is just something I was surprised to learn, um, like how you manage your emotions. This is surprisingly a big part of solving uh, hard problems. And I want to reference here um, these um, Julia Evans makes these these magazines on these little comics on uh, debugging, and and one thing she says is that about like fifty percent of debugging is a mental or emotional struggle, and just learning to deal with that is like half the half the work, and I think that that's very true, um, and this is something like mathematicians uh, will say too, uh, which you know are people who generally spend their career solving hard problems, uh, and I remember reading an interview with like a famous mathematician uh, who was saying how. Um, it's really important to start building your confidence by solving easier problems yourself. And he was saying that it's not about like you can by solving these problems you learn some like you know mathematical knowledge, but it's not that that stuff is what's going to help you solve the next problems. It's about purely like having faith in your ability to solve problems. So he was saying that like when you're when you get into this moment when you're stuck in front of a problem that seems it seems impossible. Um, you'll remember that you were in that position before and that you did solve it, something that really genuinely seemed impossible and you did solve it. So remembering that gives you kind of this confidence to go forward. Um, so this is kind of an eye opener for me that like this, you know, this kind of emotional, uh, you know, just having this memory of like confidence in yourself it may, may, is such a big um, factor in, in you solving hard problems. And I, and I, I found this to be like very true. So if you if, they, if nothing else you take away from this talk uh, is that writing bugs is is normal. It's a common thing to expect. Uh, like I would be very surprised if I ever write something and it just kind of works the first time. Um, and the other thing is that getting good at at fixing these bugs isn't about like being smart or having good intuition or it's not something you're born with. It's it's something you learn. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to tackle a problem. Some more useful than others. Um, and once you learn some of these techniques and you practice them, you can just start getting good at that. All right. So here's my story. Um, I was working on this app, uh, a music uh, app that um, you kind of make music by adding like notes in this little circle. I don't know if you can hear my audio, but basically each each of these is a note and it triggers when when the little playhead gets there. Uh, and you can make these like cyclic patterns. And when you're done, uh, you can download this as a, as a music file. So the part where you download it as a MIDI file was the part um, that I was that I was working on. Uh, and so that's what we wanted. We wanted to, when you click the download button, it creates a MIDI file and downloads it. So I found this library uh, in JavaScript uh, that can do that. But the problem was that it only worked 
uh, or at least the documentation said that it mostly worked in, in Node.js on desktop. Um, but it, it didn't look like there was anything in it that wouldn't work in the browser except for uh, this last line, where it uses the file system uh, directly to write the file. And I thought, OK, well, could I just take the file and like download it instead of writing directly to the file system? Because in the browser, you can't access the file system, but you can you know, download files. So I found this library, File Saver, which uh, said it could do that, take a file content and download it. And so I replaced it. So instead of the last line here, I put in these three lines, uh, which take the file bytes and then save uh, the music, music file. And then it just kind of downloads a link. And it seemed to work. And I got a file. And I double clicked it to listen to it. And then I got this. Uh, Windows Media Player encountered a problem while playing this file. Uh, the music file was corrupted. Uh, it couldn't, couldn't be opened. Um, so here I was, I was very stuck. And I had no idea what to do. Because normally, you know, there, there's going to be an error message that I can look at and maybe Google it and go from there. Um, but there was nothing here. The file was just corrupted. And it was, just, it was a binary file, so I couldn't. I couldn't open it with any like music editor. Every time I tried to open it with any editor, um, it you know it just said it was corrupted. So I'm so here I want to pause for for maybe thirty seconds or a minute here and ask, uh, what what would you do now? You know you have no error message. You just have this music file that's corrupted. Um, yeah. What and there's a lot of things you could do here. Um, and remember that the code, you know, looks like this. It's it's very simple. You have this library that you give it musical notes. And then you have this three lines that download the file. Um, and But what you get in, in one hand, um, it's just a corrupted file. So if you have a, if you have a, yeah, give me a moment to think about it. If you have an idea in the chat, um, feel free to post that. I'm just curious. Yes, I did try Google Book. So one one Helen says you'll you'll Google it, um, and that's a that's a great place to start. And the question I'm curious, what would you Google? Because here I'm like sitting there sitting there and Googling. What I was Googling was MIDI file corrupted, um, and I got all sorts of reasons why MIDI file would be corrupted, uh, but nothing relating to JavaScript, nothing related to the browser, nothing related to uh, this JS Midgen library that I was using. Um, Yeah, Matt suggests trying the same download with different file types. Um, yeah, that's that's good. That's a great one as well. Yeah, and Graham says compare the node output with the browser. Um, yeah, and that 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 was one of the things I did. So so here's a few good ideas. Um, generally, you want to reduce the problem. So maybe instead of you know what I was initially doing was taking the music output from the app, um, but instead of doing that, I could hard code it to just a single note to just see you know simplify the input as much as possible. Uh, I could also try Getting um, the Node.js version to work to just see if I'm if I'm if the problem is on my end if I'm even using the library correctly because maybe maybe that's my maybe that's the problem. Um, I could also yeah we'll, we'll get into some of the other ones. So so let's think about here what we are trying to figure out because um, at this point I was a little overwhelmed because I was wasn't sure where the problem could be and it felt like it could be anywhere um, because. Here's some of the questions we want to answer. So is the library we're using, JS Midgen, um, is the problem that it itself just doesn't work in the browser? Like it, when it tries to create the MIDI file, um, the content that it's creating is, for some reason, when it works in the browser, it just is invalid. Um, that's one thing I didn't know. Or is it that when I, I get, like JS Midgen produces the correct output, but Somehow, when I'm getting the output from it and downloading it, it that, that process is corrupting it? Or is it the file saver library? Is that uh, the part that's when it's downloading and corrupting it? Or is there something else that I even don't even, can't even haven't even considered? Like, is the way the, the browser downloads it, corrupting it? Like, does it have something to do with like giving, giving it the right like encoding or type, like a MIME type, um, which I think you might see in the code I did, like this type audio. Like maybe that was the thing. Maybe that's not the right type, um, and that's what's messing it up. So those were kind of the things uh, I was trying to figure out. And um, yeah, and I think here I kind of had to shift the perspective. Where initially I started with this idea that like I had no idea how binary files worked. I've never really worked with them, um, and the problem could be anywhere in all of these different libraries, or it could be in the browser. And, and I just kind of felt stuck. But but then I 
you know, I kind of slept on it and came back to it. And uh, I kind of shifted my view to, okay, a binary file is, isn't magic. It's literally just a list of bytes. And if there's a problem with it, then I'm, I have, this could be a good place to start. I, I can look at the by individual bytes. Um, and the problem's going to be there. Like the problem is that my program is outputting the wrong sequence of bytes. And maybe I can figure out how to get it to right, input the, the right sequence. Um, so there's nothing else going on, right? So I like, and I, I want to stress that because that's important because I like recognizing that the, the solution is like within my power here, right? There's, there's nothing like hidden, nothing, nothing magic uh, was really important to kind of helping me move, move forward. So uh, I started with reducing the problem. Um, which is which is one of the good techniques that you should always try to do. Um, so I, I changed it to instead of like getting all the notes from the from the from the app, it's just one hard coded note. Um, I also created a page uh, outside of of my web app, um, and this is really important because instead of what I was doing was like I'd refresh the page, I you know I drag some notes and then I hit the button to download. Um, but instead of instead of doing all that, uh, I just made a separate page that automatically downloaded as soon as I opened it. Which is really helpful because one, it it makes it so I there's no there's no question about whether some some other part of the code base is influencing it. Like I have a very limited subset of code, um, and that's what you have. And this is also really important when you're asking questions because if you if you get really stuck, a really good way to to move forward is to ask ask a question to someone else. And it's it's much easier for someone to look at your code if it's if it's a very simplified example versus if they have to like dig through your entire code base to figure out how it all works. Um, so that, that that's really important, um, and I and I and then I also got got a working version, right? Um, to, to 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 again confirm that um, it, to to compare a working version with with the with the version that outputs incorrectly. Um, so at this point, um, I still don't know how to look at the binary file, but I can at least compare the code. So on the left was the, in the browser the version that doesn't work, and on the right is in Node.js the version that does work. Both of them just output a single note. Um, and this this helps a lot because you I can see that okay well the the only difference really is in this in, in the last part which is how I output it um, so it, it you know it's, it's probably here um, and I, so what I was trying to do here was narrow down uh, where, where the problem is um, but one thing I still hadn't verified is it it could still be the JS midgen is generating the wrong bytes. Right, it's it's not necessarily that the that the output part is is the, is the problem, um, and I tried. So here's what I tried to do. I tried to compare the bytes. So you can see in both of them, um, let me get the laser pointer. Here. Both of them take file dot two bytes, and they output it. And I was trying to compare that, uh, but when I did const dot log it on both ends, I got this, which was a little hard to compare because you know they look different. But is it are they different because? They are different, or because the browser console and the command line just have this different encoding, because you get all these weird characters. And then, and, and same thing if I opened it in text editor, I got all these weird characters, so it was hard to like actually compare them. Um, so next step was was finding a way to actually look look at this data, and this is generally another you know great idea if you're kind of stuck with like printing out, uh, finding maybe a good debugger um, to help you inspect the code um, can help a lot. In my case, this was finding like a hex editor to look at the binary data. So here's what it opening in Sublime, you know, that's that's already much better. So I can see the kind of individual bytes as hexadecimal. And even better was finding an extension that would let me click on individual bytes and see that um, like this byte in hexadecimal is 4D, but the actual number, um, if you interpret it as a as an integer, uh, like in base 10, uh, is 77. So I saw. Then I learned how to do this in JavaScript. Uh, how to, you know, to look at the individual bytes in in base in base ten, um, and I could see um, I could see that the bytes were exactly the same in both versions. Okay, so that's great. That confirms. Um, if we go back to original questions, that confirms that the first one is not the the case. It's not the JS midgen is is the problem here. Um, and then this is progress. And I want to take a pause here and point out that this is where Normally, in, in the past, I would have felt that I was not making progress because I didn't write any code, right? Like, I'm still stuck with this example that doesn't work. Um, but it, it, it was progress because I already ruled out, I learned something, and I ruled out uh, one, of the, one of the hypotheses here and helped me narrow down the problem. And ever since then, I've been kind of keeping a, a debug log 
um, as I'm as I'm solving these problems, which is super useful because again, it helps you feel a sense of progress, um, and it helps you kind of narrow down. Okay, you don't need to keep checking uh, these other things. You can focus on on kind of what's next. Um, okay, so here um, here's where I was comparing uh, the the binary file. So on the left we have the one that's corrupt. On the right, uh, the one we have that actually works. Um, and again, this is only possible because we reduced the problem enough that it's a single note. This is the entire file. Um, and I was able to actually go through one by one and, and look at the list of numbers. So doing this, uh, I saw that the whole file was almost identical except for um, these few bytes. So you can see they both have this 0, 0, 0, 1, and then uh, a 0, 0. And then the difference here is on the left, we have the C2 that's not on the right. But after that, everything is all the same. Uh, so the, really, the only difference is that, that you have the C2. And in fact, I tried to remove that by hand, saved the file, ran it, opened up, and I could actually hear the music. So it actually, it actually worked. So it really was just the C2 that was the, the, the extra thing. Um, so, so again, this is another progress. Again, the code still doesn't work. I haven't written anything else, but I, but I, I know something now. I know something that I didn't think I could figure out, which is, OK, what, what is the, what's the problem with the, with the binary file? It's that it has an extra byte. Um, now the question is, why, why is there an extra byte here? Um, so this is where I was I started to learn a little bit about, about encoding and what that means. Um, so OK, if, if the bytes are all correct before writing into a file, and when I get a file, I have an extra byte, um, that means that in the process of writing to, to a file, um, some, something changes. And, and normally, that's kind of what encoding is. If you have some data and you want to figure out how to represent it in a file, um, you, you would encode it, um, right? That's kind of generally what the word means. So then I was looking at, OK, well, how much, how many bytes is, does each number need? Uh, so like in JavaScript, how many bytes does a number get stored in? Um, and so I was looking at the docs for that. And the, the method I was using to print them out says that the char code at, says that it uses um, two bytes, UTF-16. Um, for each number. OK, so if each, and, and I think I also read that in JavaScript, um, strings are also stored in UTF-16. So they all have two bytes. So if if that was true, oh, well, based on this, given, given, or given that this is true, uh, why was I only seeing one byte per number in the output? Well, that's, that's when we realized, OK, so that means we have these two bytes, and when we output them, so JavaScript is automatically converting them uh, to a single byte, mostly, and also adding this extra byte for some reason. Um, yeah, so something must something. So there, there's this change of encoding happening, or when when I save it. Um, so I look at the the blob because that's that's the the function I was using to wrap uh, the bytes that I then give to file saver because file saver acquired the input given as a blob. And if you look at this documentation, it says that. Um, the objects are encoded um, as as UTF-8, and here, yeah, here here I embarrassingly, or maybe not so embarrassingly, because I I think I want to normalize that this is this is normal. Um, this took me like at least another day just stuck on this because if the blob converts it to UTF-8, shouldn't that mean that each number is just a byte? And I know the numbers are all correct before they come in, so you know wh where is extra byte um, coming from? Um, but this was a this was a misunderstanding on my end. Uh, UTF-8 doesn't mean it uses one byte per per number. Uh, UTF-8 is a is a variable length encoding scheme. UTF-8 can actually encode a lot. So okay, so if it only used one byte, that means the numbers the range of numbers it can represent is only between zero and two fifty five. But UTF-8 can encode uh, a lot more a lot more than that. It can encode I think the entire Unicode um, selection, which is you know millions of millions of characters. Millions of you know, including um, emojis and things. Um, so the way it does this is, um, if the number is between zero and 128, it uses one byte. If the number is between 128 and like 2,000 here, or 1,920, uh, it uses two bytes, and, and and it keeps going. So that way, stuff that is more commonly used uses less bytes, and stuff that is less commonly used will use uh, more bytes. So um, the extra byte. The one, um, if we go back here, remember that the extra byte was coming in. It was supposed to be 80, but instead we were getting C2 followed by 80. 
So if you look at what is 80 in hexadecimal, in, that's 128 in, uh, in base 10. And in UTF-8, 128 is outside the range of what can be interpreted as a single byte, so it uses two bytes. Um, so it becomes C280, um, and that's where that extra byte comes from. So and having again, I haven't actually written any code yet, but now I understand where the extra byte is coming from, uh, which tells me that all I really want to do is tell Blob that what I'm giving it shouldn't be encoded as, as UTF-8. It should be encoded just as, as is. And by that, I mean every number. I give it a list of numbers, and I want each number I give it to be stored as a single byte, uh, and that's it. And to do that, uh, in JavaScript, you use typed arrays. And so this was the final solution. Um, so at the top here, I get the list of bytes. And this is actually a string, and strings in JavaScript are UTF-16. I then create this uint8 array, which tells it that each number in this array is stored as only 8 bits or 1 byte. And I, I fill the numbers here. And then finally, I give that to the blob, which will, instead of automatically converting into UTF-8, it will keep it as is because I gave it a typed array. Um, and that's it, and that works. And you can actually see in this link, and I'll post link to the slides. Actually, I'll do that now so I don't forget. Um, you can actually see, if you scroll up a bit, my um, testing code where I was simplifying the problem, where I was hard coding it to a few notes. Um, so th that was kind of cool. You can kind of see the progress where I made, where I had the debug code, and then I finally had the, the solution here. Whew, we did it. OK, so takeaways uh, here are, I think, um, oh, yeah, keeping a debugging log, that, that's one of the things that has practically been one of the most useful things uh, I've done. Um, especially when you have you're solving these big problems that take several days uh, to figure out, uh, because then when you come back, it can be hard to remember where you were in terms of which assumptions have you validated. Um, and it's also important for me to write down why I believe it's true, because sometimes um, I think I validated something based on a test, but then the test itself was uh, wasn't in, wasn't correct. Um, so writing down why I think everything is true allows me to to kind of come back and revisit things or or kind of rule them out completely and keep building. Um, and remember that kind of this, this idea of having faith and confidence in yourself is, is a big uh, part of it because remember, I, I almost gave up on this. And you know, in the past in my career, there are a lot of things where I have given up uh, were it not for this kind of um, mental shift from, you know, th this thing is too complicated and it's kind of beyond my abilities to actually, there's nothing in this file that I can't, that I can't, print out that I can't look at. Like all the num the file is just a list of numbers. Uh, so the problem is going to be in there. And, and, and believing that uh, is really important. Um, and I think investing time in reducing the problem um, is really important. And I tend to, it tends to feel like wasted time because instead of working on solving the problem, you're like creating a new page or a new script. Um, but even if for nothing else that other than it, like it speeds up your process. So, you know, maybe in a big project, it takes a few seconds to recompile or refresh or whatever, and this uh, simplified version would take would, uh, would be even faster. I, I think that does make a make a big difference, um, especially because there's this there's this kind of gap between you try something new uh, and you wait a few seconds and then it fails. Um, that's really demoralizing. So if you can make that a little faster and not have to kind of wait and get your hopes up uh, and then have it uh, break, um, I think that helps a lot. Um, and remember that. Um, you know, bugs are expected, but also an opportunity to learn something new. Like, because for me, this the simple bug and the simple line fix, the simple one line code fix, ended up teaching me a lot about how binary files work and how encoding works. Um, and that's something that has helped me a lot in, in, in my career. So, um, so now, you know, when I see something that doesn't work as expected, it's, it's kind of, it's a new mystery, right? And see if I can find the clues, if you see if I can figure that out, see what else, what new things I can learn about the world. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you for for coming. Uh, I did write kind of an article version of this. If you want to see that uh, and kind of follow through the, the same logic uh, here, um, I'd also highly recommend uh, Julia Evans's um, Xenon debugging, which has kind of a lot of uh, similar things to what I talked about here. And I think it's all um, she talks about really great principles, uh, like reducing the problem and, and good examples with that. Um, so I think that's a really good resource. Um, I think that's it. Um, I think I guess we have a minute if someone wants to have it, has any questions or anything. 
Uh, I can, can check the chat here. Um, Cunite asks, uh, do I use a platform to keep a debugging log or, or just format my own? Um, I just use a, a Google Doc. Uh, I keep a running log. Um, and I usually, I, over the years, I've kind of developed kind of my own format. And, and by that, I mean, I just have, um, you know, here's, it's kind of like, here's what I know so far. And here's what I'm trying to figure out. And because it's important to kind of keep this, what I'm trying to figure out highlighted, because a lot of times you kind of get into this rabbit hole where you, you want to, you want to figure out why this extra byte is happening. But in doing that, you need to figure out how to open the binary file, but to figure that out, you have to find a plugin, but to figure that out, you have, you know, so it's important to kind of keep the, the main goal uh, up uh, and visible. <clears throat> so someone asked for the, the links. The links are at the end of the slide. So just so you have everything, uh, I posted the link to the, to the full slides here. 